favorite of mine. I absolutely love this psalm because it ministers to us right where we are. Um, I titled it, It's Time to Wake Up from the Dream World, but another way to title this is, is Look Out for the Slippery Slope. Uh, you know, God gave us something amazing, and, and I'm not a very good athlete, um, but God gave us eye-hand coordination. Uh, it, it's part of you. Now, some people are better at it than others, and you know, if I was going to throw a baseball as hard as I possibly could, all you need to do is stand still, and I guarantee you, you'd be safe. Uh, if I were aiming at you. So, so I'm, I'm not real good at this. But with our eye-hand coordination, one of the things that we realize is, is what you're looking at matters when it comes to your balance. When it comes to your aim, what you're looking at matters, okay? And so one of the things I used to do, we, I grew up my south of, or north of my parents' house. We had a set of feed pins and lots and lots and lots of pipe pins. And the top rail of the pipe was about six feet high. And I love to try to see how far I could walk down those fences on those pipe pins. And I got to tell you, if you close your eyes, well, if I close my eyes, I'm done. I can't even stand still on the thing. But if I keep my eyes open, and it's this combination of seeing where I place my feet versus aiming down the pipe. And I got to where when I was a kid, I could, wearing the right shoes, I could walk for a pretty good ways down there. But I guarantee you, as soon as you change your focus and you look over here, you're toast. Or I was anyway. I'd I'd fall off. I love to watch the the high rope tight wire guys at the the circus, you know, and they have that great big pole. And and I never did realize what that was all about until I tried the pipe a little bit. And I realized, oh, that's a counterbalance. (laughs) That would make a huge difference. But where you put your focus is going to affect where you put your feet. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. So let's read Psalm 73. We're going to read this in pieces. Let's read the first three verses. We'll pray for God's help, and then we'll look at some more. Truly God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of of the wicked. Let's pray together. Father, we just pray that you'd help us this morning to understand the Word of God and to take it and to apply it to our lives. Father, we receive it as such, as your Word. Lord, we realize that this is not the words of men, this is not the private interpretation of man, but this is truly the Word of God. And so we pray this morning that you would help us to understand it and to apply it to our lives. Because this hits us right where we live, Lord. And we thank you for what you're going to do. We pray for the Holy Spirit's help in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, first thing I want you to look at with me this morning is walk in the slippery slope of envy. Walking the slippery slope of envy. He starts out this psalm and he says, Truly God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart, but as for me. So, so he's saying, I'm a part of Israel. I'm a part of those who are truly believers in the one true and living God. He says, but my feet were almost gone. I don't know if, uh, if you've ever gone hiking, but you get up like in Colorado or northern part of central part of New Mexico and you get up in some of the Rocky Mountains and, and there's some places where there's some rock slides. Rock slides uh, you know, sometimes you need to cross a, a rock slide to, to get where you're going. And they are unbelievably dangerous, especially if it's raining. It doesn't have to be much. I mean, it can be a little sprinkle, and those rocks are slick. And so if you can picture with me this morning trying to, to follow a trail, trying to, to stay upright, and having to cross a path that's really slickery, slippery, Slickery. I don't know if that's a word or not, but try, trying, to, trying to keep your feet underneath you. And then, as you're walking along, one of the wonderful things in life is to see part of God's creation. And you'll look up, and here comes a deer, or if you get far enough up north, 
one of those mountain goats. You talk about an incredible creature designed by God. And so here you are doing everything you can. You've got your trekking poles and you're trying to stay on the side of the hill and you're holding on to weeds to keep from sliding off the side of the hill and almost crawling to get across this thing. And here comes a deer. Boing, 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 boing. Or maybe one of those goats. Doing, 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 doing. And they, they, they don't have any problems at all keeping their feet right where they want them to be. And here I am about to fall off the side of the hill. Well, that's what he says. He says, God, we know you're good to us, but I almost slipped. Listen to me. If anybody's going to slip, it's going to be us, not God. Amen? God's not going anywhere. God's got a plan. He is good to his people. But we're the ones who have the, 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 the warning given to us that we can slip we can slide, we can fall into some really dangerous places. And that's what we're talking about this morning. We're talking to believers this morning, and we're talking about getting your eyes off of the prize and slipping into some dangerous territory. He says, as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. He hadn't slipped yet, but he said, I almost had. Now, why? What did he slip into? Was it some gross sin? Was he, was he being tempted by Satan to, to go and do something horrible that God had said not to do? Was he, was he wanting to steal or to lie or to cheat? Or No, it wasn't any of those things. What it was, was looking at the lost world and saying, look how good they're doing. Look at verse 3. For I was envious... At the foolish. Now, the foolish is a word talking about those who don't know God. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And so here's the slippery slope. When you as a child of God going through the world, you take your eyes off of Jesus and you look at the lost world. And you look at the wicked. He said, when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. You look at a person who doesn't love God. You look at a person who is, is a, a heathen. <laughs> you look at somebody who, who blasphemes God with every breath. And yet, they look like they're doing so good. They're rich. They're wealthy. They're powerful. They're healthy. They're wise. They're fun. They're having a blast. They're, they're, everybody loves them everywhere they go. They're just worshipped as men and women on this earth. Listen to me, you know who these people are. You know what this is like. This is flip on your TV and see these people. This is pick up the newspaper and read about these people. And he said, I almost slipped off the path because I got my, my heart got to envying the foolish and being jealous of the prosperity of the wicked. Proverbs 24, 19 and 20 says, Fret not thyself because of evil men, neither... Be thou envious at the wicked. You see, there's warnings all throughout the scriptures about this. That means it's something that can happen. Why do we experience envy? Well, envy is simple. Envy is the simplest little old thing in the whole wide world. It starts out really young. We could, we could play a little game of envy this morning. I'll not do it. But they taught us don't produce envy in others in kindergarten. Do you remember? If you don't have enough for the whole class, don't take your Tootsie Pop out, right? Why? Well, it's not fair for you to enjoy a sucker and not everybody else not to have one because you know what happens. If I were to walk in this morning with one orange Tootsie Pop, which, by the way, are the finest suckers on the planet, right? I love them. An orange Tootsie Pop, walk in here and give it to Wyatt. Every one of the rest of us, me included, would go, how comes Wyatt get one? I don't get one. You see that? It's envy. It's I want what you have, and you can have a pink feather. I don't care. But, but if I were to bring in a pink feather and I were to give it to, mm, let's say, Julia, all the girls might go, well, it's not fair. How come does she have a pink feather? You, you see, envy is, is simple. And you, you look around at the world and you go, man, I'm just barely getting by. I'm struggling. I'm working at it. I'm just, man, I'm having a hard time paying my bills. And I'm just barely getting by here and here and here. And, and look at the wicked. Look at this. This person hates God. And yet, they're wealthy. They're wise. Well, let's just see what it says here. The, wick, the wicked seem to do well. This is the next part we're going to look at. The wicked seem to do well. Look with me at verse 4. For there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. 
Bands mean that, that, that when they die, it's not, they don't die in fetters and chains. They're free. They, they live their lives however they want to. And their strength is firm. That, that word firm means fat. In other words, they got all they need. They're not struggling financially. They can get all the food that they need. They have all of the, the, the resources so that, that they're very, very healthy. One of the things that was so interesting to me when we were in Africa is Africans truly judge, especially men, but women too. If you're poor in Africa, you are extremely thin because you don't have enough money to get the food that you need to, to, to get fat. But politi- all the politicians... Boy, they'd do better if they got a little. Like I would do well in Africa as a politician. They also use fruits to, to you know, instead of uh, donkeys and elephants like we do, they use bananas and oranges, food. And so, so this, this word fat, firm, their strength, they've, they've got all that they need. Verse 5, they are not in trouble as other men. They, they, don't, they don't face the troubles that other men face. Neither are they plagued like other men. Gosh, they just slide through life. It seems, keep that word seems in here. This is the psalmist being, this is old Asaph, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, being as honest as he possibly can to say, when I look at the wicked, this is what it looks like they're doing. They, 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 just, they just live this perfect little life. They don't have the troubles and problems and plagues that other people have. Verse 6, Therefore pride compasseth them about as a chain. The way that you would wear a chain about your neck to, to, to display some, some pendant or ornament. They wear pride like this. The, the wicked, the wealthy, the, the, the prosperous, the, the, the fancy people. They're filled with pride and violence covereth them as a garment. They're prideful and violent. Now, isn't that interesting? And, and so he's, he's describing what he sees of the rich powerful, prosperous, lost world. This is producing envy in him. He says, it's, it, it, it was there. I, I saw it. I could feel it producing within me. How come, how come I struggle so much? And look how well they do. It says in verse 7, their eyes stand out with fatness. See, there it is. It's verses 4 and verses 7 are tied together. They're so fat, their eyes bug out. Here I am. I don't have enough food to eat. And they got more than they need. They have more than heart could wish. Anything that you could dream for, they have. And he says, it makes me envious. Listen, don't don't lie to yourself this morning if you're trying to be all pious. All of us are tempted a little bit differently, but me, I told you my story about driving off toward Coleman and looking at all those ranches and having this happen to me. How come these people have all this land and I don't? But if you're inclined to being a farmer... When you drive through wall, it'd be pretty hard not to go. How come these guys have these big farms and I don't? And if you like fancy houses, you drive through a certain area of town and go, how come these guys got these big fancy houses and I don't? They're wicked. They're, you know what I saw this morning? I drove past the golf course this morning. You know what I saw? I saw a bunch of people not taking time to come to church. Where were they headed? Go chase a little white ball around out there in the cow pasture. You see... It happens to all of us when we take a look at this world and we say these people look like they're doing great. They've got everything they need. He goes on. He says in verse 8, they are corrupt. How many articles, how many Wall Street Journal, New York Times, and those are the ones that actually run a few of these stories. How many of the real stories of the wealthy corruption do we have to see before we realize that many, many, many times these things go hand in hand. Every day we hear another story about corruption. We say, good grief, no wonder they got so much because they cheat to get it, right? Not all of them. But it happens so many times. The corrupt, they speak wickedly concerning oppression. They have no problem voicing their opinions. Klaus Schwab. If you haven't heard what this fellow has had to say over the last few years, just make you want to be sick at your stomach to listen to his elitism. Most of the people on this world are just breathers and eaters, and they have no point or no place. There's no purpose for them. We need to get rid of them. There's some really fancy, important people. We need to take really good care of them. 
this corruption and this, this oppression that they, they speak against. They, they speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They, they talk down to other people. They think they're better than other people. They set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue walketh through the earth. They actually talk bad about God and about the things of God. And their tongue walketh through the earth. They, we, we hear them everywhere we go. We hear these people. Guys like Gates. We hear the things that he has to say as they, they speak proudly and arrogantly about these things. He goes on there. Verse 10, he says, Therefore his people return hither, and waters of a full cup are wrung out to them. He's, he's saying that, that <clears throat> the people that follow these guys... They return to them and they, they, they get their cup filled up. So if you attach yourself to these guys and these gals, they take care of you, right? He says, and they say, how doth God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? I remember a politician once talked about how Christians just use God as a crutch because they were too weak to deal with life themselves. They speak lofty words against God. They, and they say, how does God? God doesn't know. There is no God. And if they do believe in God, it's a God of their own making. They don't believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They don't believe the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. They don't believe the God who gave us the Word of God. But when they do, they, they speak lofty words against Him. How does God? God doesn't know. God's not going to know. Why do you worry about what God has to say? You do whatever you want to do. Might makes right. Power and strength and money, and you can buy whatever you want, and you can do whatever you want. He says, verse 12, Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. Write it down. God already wrote it down. These are the people that are going to be wealthy. It's going to happen. It's always happened. You are reading a document that is thousands of years old, and nothing has changed. So please don't think it's going to change in our time. I fall into this trap all the time. But, you know, we go, we go, oh, my goodness, I can't believe that we haven't civilized ourselves past this by now. No, this is sin. This is what sin does. This is the way sin has always been. And the, the ungodly are going to increase riches on this earth. It's going to happen. And you and I, as followers of Jesus, have got to guard our hearts. And we've got to be careful where we set our focus, our, our gaze, because if you don't have your eyes set in the right place, you're going to slip off of the slippery slope. And Asaph says, I was this close. Boy, I almost slipped. Walking that slippery slope of envy and seeing the wicked that seemed to do so well in the earth, he says, look there in verse 13, Verily I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocency. Why am I wasting my time cleaning up my life? Why am I wasting my time listening to what God says? These people pay no attention whatsoever to what God says. The Bible says don't commit fornication. They live lives of fornication. The Bible says don't commit adultery. They live lives of adultery. The Bible says thou shalt not steal. They take whatever they want. The Bible says thou shalt not kill. They have no problem killing to get what they want. And they're getting along great. And nobody puts a stop to them. And they are prospering and they are flourishing. And here I am. I've cleansed my hands in innocency. I have done my best to, to stay out of all of those things, to avoid those things. Why? Because I love God. Because I love His Word. Because I long to live a life that's pleasing to God. I know I'm not going to earn my salvation by doing that. I know that I'm saved through faith in Jesus. But I still want to live a life that's pleasing to God. I don't want to to live that way, but it's not doing me any good. That's what he's saying. And they're getting along great. They are having a blast. He says for all, verse 14, all the day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. Not only they live without plague, right? It says up there in verse 5, they are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men, but I'm plagued. And I'm chastened every morning. Man, they lie and cheat and steal 
and I step out of line this much and God grabs me by the ear and takes me to the woodshed, grabs a switch off the woolly tree as he does and he chastens me. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 12. I tell you why I love this psalm so much, because it's so honest. We might know better than to say these things, but sometimes our hearts get caught up in the wrong stuff, and, and, and we can feel like this. Hebrews chapter 12, it says there, verse 5, And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of Him. Don't despise it when God rebukes you. Don't despise it when you get chastened. He says, I look at the wicked, they're never chastened. God doesn't get on to them. They don't get caught. They do some of the most evil and vile and wicked things, and they just live free. And I step out of line this much, and God has me ha, 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 by the ear taking me to the woodshed. He says, I'm sick of it. But Hebrews says, don't despise that. Why? Verse 6, for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Listen, if you get in trouble when you do wrong, you should thank God for it. Because he loves you enough not to let you go the way of the wicked. And if your parents help him in that, you should thank them for what they're doing. He says in verse 7, if ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But, look at verse 8. If ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. If you can live a vile and evil, wicked life and not be chastened, you do not belong to God. That's what he's saying. And so we see here the psalmist, old Asaph, he says, I'm plagued and chastened all day long. What is that telling you? He belongs to God. God loves him. I'm not going to let you go do what the wicked do. I know you want to. I know your heart's getting caught up in this. I know you're about to slip, but I'm not going to let you. I'm going to whoop you when you step out of line. I'm going to correct you when you have the wrong way of going. He says, verse 15, back to Psalm 73. If I say I will speak thus, behold, I should offend against the generation of thy children. You see, this is why we don't tell this story. Because I don't want to offend somebody else. Why? Because Jesus said... That it would be better for you to have a millstone tied around your neck and cast into the depths of the sea than to offend one of these little ones, right? And so we keep this stuff bottled in, but we still face it if we're honest with ourselves. We sit here and we we look at the wicked and how well they do, and we look at us and and, and we're just just trying to to survive and and get by, but we say, you know, I don't want to talk about this too much because I don't want to be a stumbling block to somebody else. It's a true real situation that the psalmist fell into and i believe it still happens to christians to this day that we fall into this and we're sitting here and we're and we're sitting here with the psalmist and we're going i don't know what to do what do i do because man this is hard movie stars swimming pools lifestyles of the rich and famous And then you start looking at the rich and famous and you go, oh my goodness, these people are vile. These people are, oh, look at what they do. Look at what they say. And and you don't have to, you don't have to judge them and pick them apart. All you got to do is listen to them. They'll tell you what they believe. They'll show you what they're doing. By the way, let me just preface this. Not everybody falls into this, this situation. There are some godly people who have got a lot of resources on this earth that God has trusted them with. Guys like Abraham, he was loaded. Job, he was loaded, right? There are godly people like that. Joseph of Arimathea, we're pretty sure, was a wealthy man. You can be a wealthy person and a godly person. What we're talking about is is we're talking about people who are wicked, and yet they're rich, and they're powerful, and they don't seem to have any problems at all. He says, verse 16, when I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. I love his honesty. I just, I just absolutely love the honesty of the Bible. Not a perfect man in here except Jesus. But these guys told it like it was. They lived these lives and they said, man, this is hard, God. I'm about to slip and fall and stumble. What do I need to do? Well, here's what you need to do. You need to wake up to the presence of God. That's what you need to do. 
It's what you need to do in every age. It's what Asaph needed to do. It's what you and I need to do. Watch what happens in verse 17. I love this. This is where the psalm changes course right here. How did he get it all right? How did he get back where he needed to be? Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I their end. This is why you get up on Sunday morning and you wait on your golf game and you go to church. This is why you gather together with the people of God. Why? Because you need to get your feet set. You need to get your eyes aimed in the right direction so that you can keep your feet on those slippery rocks and not slide off the side of the hill. This is why it's so important. Because Asaph says, I was lost in the weeds, man. I was caught up. I was so into the the dense forest that I couldn't see the forest for looking at the individual trees. And it happens to us. It happens to us all the time. When I was a kid, a man showed up at our house one day and he had flown over all of this area south of Roswell and taken pictures. And he had a picture of my mom and dad's house and our barn and a part of our farm and all this taken from the air. And mom and dad, they paid him a few bucks for this and bought this picture and framed it up nice and it was in the house. And man, I used to just love to look at that when I was a kid because I grew up there. I knew, I knew every square inch of all of that land, but it looks a little different from the air, doesn't it? You ever seen one of those? Some of y'all that have flown, you, 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 it seems a little different. I got this buddy, he's terrified to fly. I mean, he's just mortified and he had to, to fly in another friend of mine. And so these guys, they're going to a cow cell in California and so, you know, they look like cow buyers. They got on their press start shirts and their boots and their hats, and they get on the plane, and they get in there, and they sit down on the plane, and my friend that has flown a lot is looking at my other friend, and he ain't never flown. He's flown once, maybe, in a little bitty plane, and it terrified him. And they get set down, and they tell him to buckle their seatbelts, and he buckles it, and he, I mean, he just cinches her down, you know. And so my friend looks over there at him, and he says, pulls his hat off, spits in his hat and he just pulls it down just like a bareback rider you know gets a hold of his seat and that guy's looking at him so he does the same thing spits in his hat pulls it down over his ears gets in there and he's like you think this is gonna be bad he said no i just wanted to see what you do so anyway they take off and he's like he's like come on look out the window nope nope and he's up he's by the aisle and he's got a hold of the arm handles of that that chair and he's he's gritting his teeth and he's staring at his feet you know and so they take off and they get up in the air and they're, they're climbing out. I think they were flying out of Lubbock, maybe, Amarillo. Anyway, so my friend, he says, here, lean over here and look out the window. He's like, no, 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 I don't, no, 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 I don't do heights. I don't like heights. I'm, I'm going to look right here at the ground. No, come on, look out the window. So finally, he, he, le- he leans up. Oh, well, that's, not, well, that's not too bad. Okay. No, he looks a time or two. Finally, he looks out there, and he's like, oh, hey, look at that. He says, yeah, you can see everything from up here. He said, that's kind of neat. I see a dog running down there. He said, a dog? Where? Right there. He said, no, that's a truck. <gasps> oh, boy. He spends the rest of the time just hunkered down, staring at his feet. He was terrified. But things look different. You, you get a little different perspective. You know, maybe you've always come to a place from one direction, and then the next time somebody brings you from another direction, and it takes you a minute to kind of get your bearings. Well, well that's what God's Word does. God's Word is like a drone that flies above all of the stuff that you and I, we're down in here, we're down in the trees and we're in the weeds and you get off up above and you look down on things and you get a God's eye perspective of what's going on. And that's what Asaph said happened to him when he went into the sanctuary of God. He said, when I went into the house of God and I began to worship, then something happened. Then understood I their end. Listen to me. Just because the powerful die a peaceful death does not mean that's their end. Death is not the end. The end is when you stand before God and He decides what He's going to do with you forever. And he says, I realized that when I went to worship God, my perspective changed and he woke up again to the presence of God. Look what he says. Surely thou didst set them in slippery places. Look at what happens. My feet had well nigh slipped. Verse 2. 
But what I realized is, is that the wicked were literally set there by God in these slippery places. Thou castest them down into destruction. The end of the wicked is hell. It is a lake of fire. I want you to think with me for just a moment. And as you do, let's turn to Revelation chapter 21. I want you to think with me for just a moment of all of the blasphemous words about God that have been spoken. I want you to, I'm sorry, chapter 20. I want you to think about all of the many people that have mocked God throughout their life. Some of them openly and verbally declaring that there is no God, saying evil things about God. I want you to think about this. Using God's name as a curse word is what our our world does in so many ways. And the people that he's describing here, these wicked people, they've, they've done well, they've prospered in this life, they've got lots and lots of money and land and houses and, and clothes, and they, they, they do whatever they want to do, and they oppress other people, they're violent, they're cruel, they're corrupt so many times. But the day is coming. Revelation chapter 20, and it says in verse 11, And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great. You know, that, that doesn't mean the short ones and the tall ones. That means the, the poor, the downtrodden, the outcast, the people that you never heard of. And the important, from the Queen of England, all the way down to some pauper. And it says, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. I don't know. If that does not keep you up at night, you need to think for a moment. You will have to answer for what you have done in this life, the Bible tells us. So he says, he says, and the books were opened. What books? Man, you, you think that Twitter is keeping your information. How about God? Every thought, every word, every deed is recorded in heaven. And there ain't going to be no electromagnetic pulse to destroy God's data. He says, And another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which are written in the books according to their works. Everything that Asaph lists in Psalm 73 is going to have to be answered for on this day. I don't know about you, but that absolutely terrifies me. I heard a preacher say the other day, they said, said if, if you knew me like God knows me, you would not like me. You would not want to be my friend, and you certainly wouldn't let me preach the Bible to you. I guarantee you that. And if I knew you like God knows you, I wouldn't like you either. That's how much God knows us. And if we're honest with ourselves, we know there is none righteous, no, not one. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And for those of us who have realized it, we have run to Jesus and we have said, Lord, I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. I I believe you died on the cross to pay for those sins. I can't pay for this on my own. And I don't want to have to answer for it. I don't want to stand before this throne. I want to do anything I can. To never stand before this throne. What can I do? Live a good life. Clean your hands in innocency. Live a holy life. Work real hard at it. Get baptized, catechized, circumcised, summonized. Something. Some ritual. Some performance. some, Some good deed. No. No. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved, the Bible says. Isn't that magnificent? Isn't that wonderful? You know, that's the good news. And, and when you come to know Jesus, He takes all of that. And he, he pays for it. But these folks, the folks that Asaph is talking about in Psalm 73, they will stand before this throne. Listen to me. If you know Jesus today, you won't have to answer at this judgment. You'll have your own judgment, but it won't be one that you get condemned from. He says, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. The books were open. Another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. Death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into 
the lake of fire. A lake of fire. You see, what Asaph means when he says, I went into the sanctuary and then I realized their end. Verse 17, until I went into the sanctuary, then understood I their end. That's what he's saying. When I went into the sanctuary, I realized and I remembered and I understood these people will have to answer to God for the life that they lived. He says, surely thou didst set them in slippery places. Thou casteth them down into destruction. How are they brought into desolation? As in a moment, they are utterly consumed with terrors. They live their life in ease. They live their life in pleasure. They live their life doing whatever they wanted to do. If they got in trouble, somebody bailed them out because of their money. They did anything and everything. They did not hold back on the... the, 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 the the indulgences of their fleshly appetites. But someday they will have to answer for all of those things. And he says it's going to happen in a moment. Turn with me, if you will, to the book of Habakkuk, chapter 3. I I put this verse in your bulletin, I believe. But the believer has a different situation. You see, God set these people in slippery places. And he says, I almost slipped. Why didn't he slip? Because Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 19 says, The Lord God is my strength, and He will make my feet like hinds' feet. That's a doe. And He will make me to walk upon mine high places. Amen. When you get saved, God gives you hinds' feet. And you walk along that slippery slope of envy, but you won't slip because He holds you. Because He's given you hinds' feet. He helps you. He strengthens you. He's the strength. Julia shared it with us this morning. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Why is it that believers don't slip off of that slope? Well, because we come to church. Because we fix our gaze back in the right place. Because we realize that God has given us hinds feet to navigate through this life and to walk across those slippery old rock slides and not slip and fall off to the destruction that's below There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the ends thereof are the ways of death. The wicked do what seems right to them, and it will end at the great white throne by them being cast into the lake of fire because they did not love the truth and they did not cry out to Jesus. They did not give up on themselves, but they clung to their names and their reputations and their powerful positions and their own good works and their own ideas. And all of those things will cast them down into the lake of fire. But the believer gets hinds feet to walk on the high places through this life. He says there that when this happens in verse 19, how are they brought into desolation? As in a moment. As in a moment. Turn with me, if you will, to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. There's a story there that we can benefit from. Luke chapter 12 that we can learn a lot from. It says there in verse 16, Jesus tells this parable unto them. He spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. What a problem. (laughs) My harvest stores aren't big enough for all this grain. My silos aren't big enough. I have a bumper crop. What am I going to do with it? He says, Verse 18, he said, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. So he says, I got to tear down my granaries and I got to build bigger ones to hold this bumper crop. And then look what he says in verse 19. And I will say to my soul, he's communicating with his soul. He knows he has a soul. His soul is going to outlive his body. All of them are. Mine is, yours will, all souls will outlive your body. He says, I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. You see, that's that's the mentality that the psalmist is talking about. I got plenty. I got more than enough. I'm not worried about supply chain issues out of China. I'm not worried about food processing plants getting shut down. I got plenty. Oh, some people might get hungry, but it won't be me. Why? Because I'm the one who takes care 
of me. Right? That's, this is this guy. But look at verse 20. But God said unto him, Thou fool. Thou fool. You see, that's the same word that Asaph used to describe the people he was talking about. The fool. What is the fool? The fool says in his heart, there is no God. The fool lives as if there is no God. God will say to him, hey fool, this night thy soul that you are communicating with shall be required of thee. Tonight. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Now, this has nothing to do with being benevolent or sharing with the poor. Nothing. It has everything to do with a guy who does not trust in God, but trusts in himself. Let me ask you a question. If you have a bumper crop, why did you have a bumper crop? (laughs) Because God blessed you, didn't he? Isn't it amazing? God causes His mercy and His reign to be on the just as, the, as well as the unjust. God is merciful to people who hate Him all the time. And this guy was not rich toward God. He had not invested his life seeking after God. He had not pursued a relationship with God. He was not right with God. This guy was lost. And here's the problem. <coughs> Instead of taking care of his soul... He had taken care of his body. He had stuff for his body, food, but he didn't feed his soul. You see, here's the thing that you're not guaranteed of. That's probably not a sentence. Here is something of which you have no guarantee. How about that? Tomorrow. You have no guarantee of tomorrow. This man thought he was going to live for years and years and years, and God said, I require your soul tonight. Report. I am sending my angels to come and bring you to the place of judgment. Now. Tonight. Are you prepared for that? Are you, do you live your life? You know what? The younger you are, the more you think you'll live forever. Believe me, I never dreamed I'd make it to 30. I'm looking at 50, and I can't believe it. Man, I would have done things differently if I'd have thought I was going to make it this long. Now, I'm beginning to change course. I guess now I believe I'll just aim for 100. But you see, when you're young, you think you're going to live forever. You make these plans, you know, 10, 12, 20, 30, 40 years down the road. You don't think this day is going to come. But listen to me. This day could come. It could come today. It could come today. There are so many things that can kill you. The list is extremely long. And there's a bunch of stuff that shouldn't kill you that does sometimes. This man was not prepared to die. He had not made provision for his soul, but he had stored up for his body. He indulged his flesh. That's what the, the wicked do that Psalm 73 is talking about. They give themselves, their body, everything that they can want. All the stuff that money can buy can only take care of your body. It can't take care of your soul. You know, you buy insurance. Wealthy people buy insurance to protect all the stuff that they have. The bigger, more expensive stuff you have, the more insurance you need. I remember a few years ago, sitting down talking with my insurance agent and him going, you're only carrying like $50,000 worth of liability insurance. We've got to up this. He said, you could get run over by an Escalade, and that stupid thing could cost over 100000 and you don't have enough to cover it, right? <clears throat> what about your soul? Have you taken care of your soul? Have you provided insurance for your soul? Because someday you're going to have to answer for the stuff that your soul has done, things you've thought, things you've said, the places that you've gone. And so, back to Asaph, he says, he says this can happen in a moment. He says, they are utterly consumed with terrors. Verse 20, as a dream when one awaketh, so, O Lord, when thou awakest, thou shalt despise their image. Listen to me, it is time to wake up. If you're not awake this morning, it is time to wake up. It is time to start paying attention to where you place your feet. Romans 13, 11 says, And that knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. Listen to me, you can fall into this, this trance going through this life. And you can get caught up in the dream world that the wicked live in. Did you know that that is truly what is happening? The wicked live in a dream world. 
They pretend that men are women and women are men. They pretend that they are furries and, and fluffies and, and, and things like this. They pretend that, that they are, uh, you know, some other race than they truly are. They pretend all of these different things. They live in a dream world. They pretend like voting a certain way can change the climate. They pretend all of these different things and they live in this dream world. But what God wants for us to do is to wake up. Wake up to the reality. Listen, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. That's it. All of this other stuff begins to melt away. And so he says there, as a dream when one awaketh, so, O Lord, when thou awakest, thou shalt despise their image. The Lord has no joy in doing this, but he will send these folks to hell. Verse 21, thus my heart was grieved and I was pricked in my reins. He says, this broke me. I got caught up in this. I was envious of these people. I, I, was, I, was, I was about to slip down the side of the slope. So foolish was I and ignorant. I was as a beast before thee. Can you hear? This is repentance taking place in the heart of a believer. Oh God, I almost got caught up in it. I was allowing, now listen to me young people, I was allowing lost people to be my heroes. Listen to me. I was allowing wicked people to be my heroes. I was looking at people who do not love God and saying, I want to be like them. What a trap. What a travesty. Listen, if God were to require their soul tomorrow, they have nothing to say at the judgment seat of Christ. And you know what they'll do? Every one of them will bring up their good deeds. That's what they'll do. They'll come before God and they'll boast and they'll brag just like they do here. And Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. When you get to the great white throne judgment, there will be a bunch of boasting, but it won't last very long. Because when God opens those books, every mouth will be silenced. What a terrifying thing. And so, so he says, oh God, I was a, I was a I was a beast before. I wasn't even acting like a man. I, I was acting like an animal in, in this. Verse 23, Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. You see, you need to wake up to the presence of God. What he realizes is, is oh yeah, God's with me. Now we shouldn't have to get there, but sometimes we need a aha moment like that. Oh yeah, I'm redeemed. Oh yeah, Jesus died on the cross. Oh yeah, the blood of Jesus cleanses me from all of my sin. Oh yeah, I have the Holy Spirit living with, with me. God is always with me. He says, Thou hast holden me by my right hand. You see, there's two reasons that you don't slip off the side of the slope. Number one are the hinds feet that God's given you. But number two is the fact that He's got a hold of you. Amen? He says, You were holding me, thou shalt guide me with thy counsel, and afterward receive me to glory. Where are the wicked going? To hell. Where am I going if I'm in Christ? To glory. Oh, yeah. Please, God, forgive me for getting caught up in all of this. Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon earth that I desire beside thee. Listen to me. If you want to have a hero today, let's let it be Jesus. Amen? Let's let our hero be Jesus. Let's fix our eyes on Jesus. Let's be more like Him. Because if we get caught up looking at worldly people, lost people, and, and want them to be our heroes, we're going to start acting like them. And we know what their end is. And when you come to the sanctuary to worship, you get everything reset back the way it needs to be. You get your eyes fixed on the right place. You get reminded, oh yeah, God's with me. He says, verse 26, my flesh and my heart faileth. That's so true. This old body's going to wear out. One of these days, it's going to quit working. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. He says, I have God in my life. For lo, they that are far from thee shall perish. There's that word. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not 
perish but have everlasting life. You can have everlasting life. And if you have everlasting life this morning, when you come to church, you get your eyes put back in the right place. Amen? You get your focus back on Jesus. He says, Thou hast destroyed all them that go a-whoring from thee. That's the end of the person who doesn't love God. But it is good for me to draw near to God. Amen. It's good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all thy works. Listen to me. I just want to encourage you this morning. I love this psalm because it's so honest and it's so true. It, it, it affects us, each and every one of us, every single day. And it is such a trap to look around the lost world and to see lost people who it looks like are getting along good. But this world is not our home. This world is not the end-all, be-all. Getting along in this world is not the ultimate focus of the believer. The ultimate focus of the believer is to put your eyes on Jesus and to realize that you may not have the wealth and the prosperity that the wicked encounter in this life, but you will in eternity. Remember what Jesus said about the rich man and Lazarus. He told the rich man, in your life, you had your good things. He is now being comforted as he was in Abraham's bosom. And that can't even start what he's going to wind up with in the new heavens and the new earth. Amen. Listen, most people's sight is too short-sighted. It's too short-sighted. Most people are looking at the here and now, and we need to get up above all the trees and look and see the whole landscape and look way down the road to eternity and coming to church and reading your Bible and praying and singing songs to Jesus and praising Him. These are things that put your focus back in the right place. It's good to draw near to God. Amen? And then, Father, we just give you this time. And, Father, we're so grateful for your word. Lord, all of us have been tempted by this. We, we look around and we say, gosh, the, the, the evil of this world look like they're doing great. And we're just barely getting by. But, God, please help us to understand that you chase in those that you love. Please help us to understand that unless a man repents, he's going to be like that rich man. His soul's going to be required of him, and he's not going to have anything to be redeemed with. But, Lord, you've given your Son to redeem every soul. And so, Lord, if there's somebody here this morning that's never trusted in Christ, I pray that today would be their day of salvation, that they would call upon the name of the Lord Jesus and receive him as their Savior. We thank you, Lord, for your presence in our life. Help us to wake up to the reality of what you're doing in Jesus' name.